<laughs> yeah, but watch what happens. <clears throat> so good morning. Welcome to Calvary Chapel Inland, Devo 30. I'm Pastor Ruben. We stream live on Facebook every Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays. And if you go to our YouTube page at Calvary Chapel Inland, you will find all our other Devos on the various uh, books of the New Testament. If you're in the neighborhood, like to join us like these good people here, brothers and sisters in Christ. Uh, we'd love to have you here at 5383 Martin Street in Harupa Valley. And afterwards, we pray for one another, for the church and for the community. Today, we are starting a new book, a new study in Titus. <clears throat> and we'll be in chapter 1. So let's go ahead and pray. <clears throat> Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity to open up your precious word. And Lord, our hearts as believers is to know your truth. Father, we don't want it watered down. We don't want to assume, we want to hear directly what your word has to say to us, Father. Whether we uh, like it or not, Lord, but we should receive it, Lord, in the spirit of truth. And that is our heart, Father. And so, Lord, as I just share the word and interpret it, Father, within within the context of the scriptures, Father, and then give application. May that be enough for all of us, Lord God, that our lives, Father, may truly reflect our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us again. So we're in Titus, <clears throat> and we'll be in chapter 1. So just a real quick background. As, you, as we saw last week, we were in 2 Timothy, the last time we met. Second Timothy, <clears throat> and we saw it was Paul's uh, last letter uh, written to his beloved Timothy, a friend, student, pupil, uh, pastor, passing the baton. Uh, we come now to Titus, which is the second uh, book of the pastoral epistles that uh, Paul wrote to uh, pastors of churches. Titus was another young man that Paul poured into and then left in Crete to uh, pastor a ministry there. And so Paul gives him some advice that's similar to, to Timothy, um, but there are some, some fascinating things in this little epistle here. And by the way, this little epistle is for all of us, even though it's written to two pastors, it's written to them and how they ought to um, govern over their churches, right? So we can gain some insight as people that are involved in churches and how churches should be governed. I was uh, at a meeting yesterday, <clears throat> and afterwards the topic came up about finding a, a church. And I thought it was interesting, uh, these people that were talking about finding a church and the things that they look for and so forth. I thought it was interesting what they looked for, and they were both different you know, when they were approaching churches. And one person said it takes a while for you to find a church. Some churches you go into and immediately you go, nope, we won't be back here. You know, Other churches you kind of like, okay, I see that, I see this over here, I, I hear that, I'm not quite sure, let me, let me come back again, let me be here for a couple of weeks, maybe a month, <clears throat> and see how it is, and then decide whether I want to uh, stay or not. <clears throat> what I found interesting was the, the teaching of the word never came up. <clears throat> the teaching of the word was wow. secondary to um, some other things that they wanted to see. Um, I think the teaching of the word should be first among Amen. it, and then the reflection of that teaching should be in the church. Um, if it is a Bible teaching church, then you definitely have a plus right there immediately compared to a topical type of church. Now, I don't mind topical churches as long as somewhere along the line you are going through the Bible within that church. Maybe on a Wednesday night, some Calvaries will go through the Bible on a Sunday night, and they'll hit five chapters at a time going through each book and, and going through it rather quickly. Sure. Some Calvaries uh, like going through the Bible in Sunday mornings. A lot of Calvaries do that. But some Calvaries take a topic from what they're going through uh, on Sunday nights through the scriptures and they will um, give that topic on Sunday mornings. This is what Chuck did. He used to do that. He'll take a topic of what he's been going through on Sunday nights and he will teach on, on Sunday. So... Not that he was a topical teacher, he was a Bible teacher going through the Bible. So anyway, um, it does deal with church issues and it's fascinating what we see here and how we as a church should respond to leadership also. So it's important that we have that heart. See, God is looking for a heart that is teachable. He, he, he doesn't need people to go into the church and say, okay, this is how it should be run. 
You know, he doesn't need someone going in there and changing things. You go in there with humility, you go in there with grace, and you go in there with mercy. And you say, Lord, where do I fit in in this situation? And then you trust in God with uh, everything uh, else uh, that happens in that church. And you pray for leadership. You pray for them that God would lead them. And prayer is powerful. Prayer is powerful. We see it throughout the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and what prayer can do. So you pray for, for the leadership. But going in and, and having the attitude. I had one guy say that God's called me to watch over you. You know, and correct you every time you, you err. And I thought, wow, where's that in the Bible? I said, I don't know where that's at. And, and if you come in with that attitude, that's, that's, it's not going to be helpful. It's, it's going to be a struggle for you and, and for the church itself. No, we are the body of Christ. And by the way, we're all flawed. We're all skewed. We all sin. We all have our tendencies. As even the Apostle Paul said, I'm the chief of sinners, First Timothy uh, one. 15. So if he's a chief of sinners, boy, what does that make me mm. or us, you know, who, who are far less than the Apostle Paul who did great things. So Paul writes to Timothy, Paul is servant of God. I love that because that is the first thing he says, right? He says that immediately right there to Titus. I am Paul, a servant of the Lord. He makes it very clear that if you are an apostle, if you are of Christ, if you are a pastor, an elder, a deacon, you are a servant of the Lord, a minister of God. In fact, if you go to Romans chapter 15, I think it's, no, 13, and it talks about governments, it talks about government officials or police officers being servants of the Lord. They are ministers of God. They're instruments that God has ordained to keep the peace in the world. So I really believe that this is the first thing that we ought to be looking for in, in people. Are they servants of the Lord? How do you tell if someone is a servant? Do they come up to you and say, Pastor, I'm a servant. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay, thank you. I appreciate you telling me that you're a servant. Uh, you know, I wanna see it. I had a guy here years ago, wanted to teach the, the Bible. And I made a mistake. I made a lot of mistakes, by the way, uh, earlier on. And I made him an elder. <clears throat> and his heart was just to teach the Bible. And, and I remember saying to him, you have to be a servant. He goes, no, no, no. I'm called to teach, not to serve. And, and I thought, no, you got it wrong. <laughs> Obviously, you're not studying your Bible. No, the Bible's called us to teach. If Jesus said, I did not come to be served, but to serve, then we ought to be servants too. And so I asked him to, to uh, come on Sunday mornings and help us set up. So we got here early and he got here early and we started setting up. He never set up. He just followed me around, talking to me about Bible studies and words and things. He was giving me a Bible study basically while I was setting up. And so I realized that he's not a servant. He doesn't get it. You have to be a servant. How do you tell if someone's a servant? You just watch them. It, it comes naturally. If God is calling them to ministry, to be a pastorate, uh, to be a, an elder, a deacon, a leader, then they're going to be servants. Uh, you watch them as they're going down the parking lot. They see a piece of paper. Do they look at it and go, oh, wow, and they walk away? Then probably not a servant. Uh, they should pick it up because they see that there's a piece of paper on the ground that shouldn't be there. And they pick it up, a cigarette, but whatever it is, they're looking to help. They don't just sit there while everyone's throw, putting chairs away and tables and things like that. And they're just, oh, look at those guys. Well, that's nice. You know, they get up and they start helping. That's the servant's heart and one that is revealed by their actions without having to say anything. And we see that in the Apostle Paul. Paul, a servant of God, an apostle of Jesus Christ, according to the faith of God's elect and the knowledge of the truth, which is according to godliness, in hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before time began. <clears throat> now, the promise of eternal life... Um, before, the, before time began. Uh, Paul makes a statement here. Uh, God who cannot lie. That's an interesting statement. Um, I think as men, we all have lied in the past. And lying is not telling the truth. Lying is leaving out the truth. Lying is diverting from the truth. Lying is big, but it's also white lies. Lying is lying. And I just had to say all that because sometimes we think, no, if it's a little lie, it's not a lie. No, that's like saying you're a little pregnant. So, so either you're pregnant or you're not. No, the Bible says very clearly that we are all liars. And by the way, I am too. We've all lied. And at times we still lie. We lie on our, our tax forms, you know. 
uh, well, you know, I donated this much, but let's just add another couple of bucks on there. You know, maybe I get a write-off, you know, or so forth. Or, or let's put some shoes on there as a write-off because of work, but you really don't buy work clothes, but I do wear them when I go to work, so that should count as a write-off, you know. And we do those kind of things. We all lie. And the Bible says, if you lie, what are you? You're a liar. You're lying. Now, God does not lie, Paul said. <clears throat> he does not lie at all. If you think God lies, then you're mistaken. Because God doesn't even have the ability to lie. It's not in him to lie. And so if he says something, it will come to pass. It will come true. You can depend on that. You can believe it with all your heart. Don't be one of these people that doesn't get what they want and then they call God a liar because they think he should have given it to them when God never promised them to have that. So don't uh, call God a liar because he's not a liar. You know, God promised Abraham that his seed would be multiplied. You know, Abraham never saw that. Could Abraham stand there and say, God, you lied to me. I never saw my seed multiplied. You know, I didn't see myself turn into this great nation. How could you lie to me in that way? Well, God's promise wasn't for Abraham to see. It was given to Abraham, but it was not for him to see. That promise came later, much, much later. So God is not a liar. Uh, his timing is different than our timing, though. And we need to understand that. And so Paul makes that clear that if he doesn't lie, then there's hope of eternal life. And there's also hope of eternal life through his son, Jesus Christ, alone. Verse 3, but has in due time manifested his word through preaching, <clears throat> which was committed to me according to the commandment of God, our Savior. So one of the things that should happen in the church is teaching, preaching. Uh, you have disciples. And we're all disciples, by the way. Some of us are good disciples. Some of us aren't so good. Some of us are willing disciples. Some of us are just disciples by name, you know, because God calls us all disciples. We are to learn about Jesus Christ. That's why we come on Sunday mornings. Uh, I hope you don't go to a church and go Sunday mornings to, to feel good, like I've done something spiritual, and now uh, I put in my time, and now I can just go out and enjoy life. No, that's not what it is. That's religion. This is about relationship. You're coming to hear from God. But there's a man up there. He's not God. No, he's not. But when he speaks forth, he is prophesying. He's giving you words of knowledge. He, he, he is giving you the word of God. And those things will not return void. Uh, I'm amazed at how many times uh, God ministers to people. And people will come up afterwards to me and say, how did you know I was going through that? How did you know that? Why are you talking to me? You know, who told you those things? And, and I've got to like defend myself. Like, no, no, I didn't even know. You know, that's the Holy Spirit. That's how he works. And people don't believe it. But see, prophecy is happening in the teaching. Discernment is happening mm -hmm. in the teaching. The gifts are working of teaching and God is ministering. So when you receive, you're receiving from God. I'm not God. I'm just the instrument that he uses, the mouthpiece. Because I am nowhere near God, by the way. I am skewed and flawed. And as Justin Alfred would say, I'm a wart on the back end of a hog. You know, and I'd probably say I'm the tick on the hair of a wart on the back end of a hog. That's how bad I am. And <clears throat> I know that. So, <clears throat> preaching, teaching, that's what we do. And God uses it to minister. Now he says, after his introduction, to Titus, my true son, in our common faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. For this reason I've left you in Crete, that you should set in order the things that are lacking and appoint elders in every city as I command you. So apparently things were lacking in the church. And one of the things that were lacking were a lack of elders. There were not men. Now, I don't know why, Tim, why Titus did not appoint elders. I don't know if he didn't have really a good pool to choose from. So he didn't really appoint any at that time or whether the pool that he did have, they just weren't up to it yet. It doesn't tell us. But Paul says that there are no elders there or few elders and there needs to be more elders and Titus you need to appoint these elders because there's some things going on in the church there that need to be put back in order now there's always something going on in the church by the way that will never change 
we're wishful thinking if we think that church will be perfect. <laughs> you know, we'll all come in, and when we open those doors, the bright light just shines, and the glory of God's on us, and we're going, <laughs> hallelujah, brother, how are you? Praise God. And nothing is going wrong, right? And everyone's raising their hands and praising God and focusing on Him alone. They're all bringing their Bibles in with their pens and their markers, <laughs> ready to hear from God. You know, their phones are put away and they're turned off because they want no distractions. I mean, you, it would be nice if church was like that, right? Everything was in order and all the kids were dressed up nice, going to class, saying, yes, Mrs. Solis, yes, this, you know, very cordial and nice, and there's no arguing, there's no leave me alone, there's no, that would be nice. That would be, per, that would be heaven, wouldn't it, here on earth? But unfortunately, it's not like that, right? <coughs> some people come with their Bibles and some don't. <coughs> Some are out there and they're trying to do some things and others are looking at them like, why are you doing it that way? <laughs> you know? And the kids are coming in all running around and making noise and jumping all over the place. So things are always uh, at a place where we need to set them in order. And now that doesn't mean that we leave them like that. Oh, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. Let's just leave it alone. Some people think that way. And if they don't think that way, they live that way. They might not tell you that, but that's how they live because what's the use of washing dishes? I'm going to wash them tomorrow. Right? And, 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 you know, some people don't even have dishes. They'll get paper plates because they don't want to wash dishes. They just throw them away and I don't have to worry about that. That's a great idea. That's a great idea. During the week, I'll just use paper plates and don't have to ever wash. You know, and it, it's hard because who likes washing dishes? Anybody like washing dishes? You guys like, you two guys like, well, you're strange. You're peculiar people, as the Bible says. I do not like washing dishes. Oh. And, and yet alone, every single day, three times a day, well, usually we let them pile up, right? Mm. And then we wash them all. Uh, what if you had to do it after each meal? Oh. You know? Like in this church here, we have a kitchen. It should be done after each meal because we don't know who's going to be coming in and out. And we want this place to always be ready in season, out of season for anyone that would be coming in and out. So there's always something to be done. Something to get be in order. We can't just say, oh, it's going to happen again. No, we need, to, we need to live as though now is now. And <coughs> when we're done with the dishes, God could return. At least we left this place clean for all the heathens that will go through the tribulation. Period, right? <laughs> and they'll come in here and go, wow, this is a clean place. Those guys were really nice before that trouble starts. So put in order. Order some, some elders and raise them up. And he gives us some... Um, information about the type of elders. Now, here's where it applies to you, because you might have a desire to be an elder. And if you do, then read uh, Timothy, read Titus, look at those characteristics and become them. Really become them. Seek God out that he may do it uh, in his power, and his might, not in your own strength because you want a position, but Lord, really make me this person. Uh, that I can serve your people and be very effective in supporting the pastor of that church. So he says in verse 6, If a man is blameless, the husband of one wife... So you got to have one wife, guys, so get rid of the other one. You just can't, you can't do that and be an elder at the same time. You know, two wives. I, I just... Whew, one wife is enough, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, it's just crazy. You go crazy. Just uh, everything that... that you need to do the honeydew list and, and then the list that, that you're supposed to know about, but you have no idea it's even there, you know, and the ups and the downs. And it, one wife is a lot of work. And I'm sure the husbands are too, but can you imagine two wives? Two of them pulling and tugging at you? I and mean, it's like, I think I would go crazy. No, one wife, guys, if you want to be an elder. Blameless, a husband of one wife. Faithful children, not accused of dispensation or what... Uh, we would say in English, rioting, uh, di uh, like a prodigal type of son that's out there in the world while they're living with you, that you're trying to put that in order to some degree. <clears throat> you're not responsible for them. They're responsible for themselves. But you're doing everything you can to get them in order. <clears throat> so not dispensation or insubordination. Uh, for a bishop must be blameless as a steward of God. So he has to walk blamelessly, not perfectly, but blamelessly. You know, he'll stumble and fall. But again, his desire is to please God and walk right. Um, not only walk right, but be a steward of God. 
That is what God has entrusted to him, that he takes care of those things. So a steward of God, not self-willed, so important. And this applies to all of us, by the way, whether you're seeking to be an elder or not. We shouldn't be self-willed. It should be your will be done, Lord. That's the prayer, right? Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the prayer that Jesus gave to the disciples. This is how you ought to pray. Not, Father, can I have this? Father, can I go there? Father, what about me? Father, I'm not a, a, a walking mat. Father, I need this. Father, heal me. You know, <clears throat> I'm not saying you can't pray those things, but they shouldn't be uh, the things that you're praying about all the time. It's, Father, what is your will for my life? I don't know if you've ever prayed this, but maybe you ought to think about it. Lord, is this trial that I'm going through, is this needed? then Lord, let the trial continue and let me learn what I need to learn. That's hard prayer, isn't it? Yeah. That is a hard prayer because our prayer immediately is, Lord, take this away from me. I don't want it, Lord, right now. Please, in the name of Jesus, you promised me, Lord. No, he didn't promise you. He said he'd get you through. But have you ever thought that maybe God is refining you? You know, refining you. If, if <clears throat> you're refining something, you're putting it in that that heat, that fire, and you're melting that, that dos off of it, the impurities, and it floats to the side as you become pure. And that's not easy. That's a lot of heat that has to take place before you become pure. But that's what God is doing. He's changing you through the trials. And so a bishop and all of us should not be self-willed, not quick-tempered, not given to wine, not violent, not greedy for money, but hospitable, a lover of what is good, Sober-minded, just, holy, self-controlled, holding fast the faithful words as he has been taught them. That's important. Tie that in up there to God calling Paul to be a preacher. Preacher of what? To the faithful words of God. That is this book from Genesis to Revelation. And if you can, in the Greek language so that you know originally what it says. It is amazing. Speaking of politics, which isn't even the subject here, but it is amazing when you know the, the, um, the original language, Hebrew and Greek. For instance, you know in the Old Testament where um, God condemned Cain and Abel's situation, right? Uh, Cain was condemned for killing his brother. And then God says that if you shed a man's blood, that you'll be judged by uh, that man or by the, the man, right? Well, in the Hebrew, it's interesting in the Hebrew, when it says, you're, you, uh, if you shed man's blood, then your blood will be shed by the man. It says the man. And we always just read it real quick and think, oh, by the man's family or something. You know, they have the, <clears throat> in, the, in, in the Hebrew, it's talking about a judicial system. God has established a, judicial, a political judicial system way back then. If you shed man's blood, then there will be the man who has become a judge, and he will judge your case, and he will then shed your blood. So a court system already. Mm. It's amazing. So God is the one that is in charge of the political system, and he has established it. And I just had to say that because so many people are like, we shouldn't be involved in politics. God is involved in politics. He created politics. We just need to get the evil corruptness out of politics Amen. is what we need to do. And men and women should stop... <laughs> justifying their lack of participation uh, by saying God doesn't want us involved by getting involved and in being those godly men to change this world. Because you can you imagine if this world was run by Christians? It'd be a better oh, place. It'd be a better awesome. place. So, he said you got to be faithful uh, to the word that has been taught, that he may be able by sound doctrine both to exhort to co and convict those who contradict for there are many insubordinate, both idle talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision, whose mouth must be stopped, who subvert whole household, teaching things which they ought not for the sake of dishonest gain. Boy, what a picture of a lot of preachers today, huh? Wow, that just come into households, take over a, a, an old grandma, and then the grandma then just gets the kids all involved, and there you go, now you have a wealth faith, the doctrine, prosperity, and all of that garbage. And you've subverted that whole household. Be careful that it's biblical. Look at verse 12. Now he's talking about Cretans here. It says, one of them, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. That was going around. 
that was glaring. That was, you know, you're you're sitting in the in the courtyard there or over there by the gate and you overhear the conversation and two Cretans talking to each other. Yeah, I've never come across a Cretan who told the truth. You know, he's a liar. I, I, all I hear from them is lies, lies, lies. And, and they're evil beasts. Aren't they lazy? They just sit around yeah. all day long doing nothing. It's amazing how they can find nothing to do, you know, all day long. And Paul says, even their own say these things. This testimony is true, he said. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in faith, not giving heed to Jewish fables, fables and commandments of men who turn from the truth to the pure. All things are pure. But to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. Doesn't that remind you of Genesis chapter 6? Right? Where it says that even their imaginations were defiled yeah yep they profess to know god all right listen to this and we'll close right here they profess to know i know god i love god i love jesus he's my savior i go to church on sundays once in a while but in works they deny him they have no works at all they don't give their tithe they don't help at the church to set up or tear down they don't get involved in ministry. They don't come out to events to help out. They don't do any works at all. And then not only that, but the works that just come naturally, living their Christian life before others. You know, they smoke, they cuss, they don't do things that are Christian-like. And so they have no works. They say they know God, but they deny him being an abominable, disobedient, and disqualified for every good work. Wow. That's a scary place to be, to think that you're a Christian, and the fact is you're not, that you're not. People are like that. People are like that. I'm glad that people ask, <coughs> ask questions, because their questions need to be asked if they're sincere. But there are people that just ask questions because they don't want to believe. And even if they heard the answer, they don't really want to uh, apply it to their lives. They won't apply it to their lives. Why is that? Because they have not the Spirit of God in them yet. Oh, again, Roman... Uh, John chapter 8. I don't know if you read that or not. The, the latter part, Paul, uh, Jesus talks about the religious leaders not hearing his voice because they don't know him very clearly. And God's people will know him clearly. You might not know him as much as you like, but you will know his voice as you read it. So let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for your precious word, Lord. And I do pray for all those that are deceived, Father, thinking that they know God. But the reality is, Lord, they don't know God because they deny him by the very works that they do. They have no works, Lord. Um, and I say that with a broken heart, Lord, because they're deceived. They're very deceived, just as James even said himself, be doers of the word and not just hearers only. You know, if they were really believers, they would be in church every Sunday. <clears throat> they really would, because the Bible says to be. And there's just a natural hunger to know God. Uh, and to be in that place where God is and where the word is taught, Lord. And that's just one evident, Father, of our salvation. But to not have any of that, Lord, ever, Lord, and to only come out on maybe Easter, if you make it that year or maybe the next year, Lord, it's sad, Lord, because they're deceived. And they're going to stand before God. And he may just say to them, depart from me, I don't really know you. You've never had any works that showed that you were my child. I pray for them, Lord. Please, Father, open up their eyes and their hearts and understanding to your word. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. We will see you next Friday. I will be gone next week, the first part of the week. So uh, sorry about that. We'll see you next Friday as we hit chapter two. Have a wonderful weekend. And if you do live in Harupa Valley, come to church. Join us as we teach through the Bible and serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Have a wonderful day.